And I'm an environmental and development economist with the inclusive growth team in RSC Addis. Uh, today we have a, a pretty exciting agenda and a webinar for you, uh, which will include a, a, a few countries uh, that will present, namely Iswantini, Eritrea, Comoros, Namibia, and Botswana. Uh, this webinar will basically cover a, a guidance note that we have developed on how to draft an RRF on social protection as well as how to apply a much more integrated approach uh, across these thematic areas. And now we've organized this webinar to go over it and to give a platform to country offices for sharing their work and questions on the RFF problem. Um, what we also uh, would like to highlight is that we, uh, we can also provide you uh, support by holding something like a Zoom clinic on a weekly basis uh, for colleagues who want hands-on support with drafting their RFFs. Uh, so with further ado, I turn it back to uh, Petra uh, for the next uh, agenda item. Thank you, Usman. Uh, welcome everyone again. Uh, just a few housekeeping items before we proceed. Uh, there is an interpretation from English to French and from French to English available. Uh, it's on the panel. You can switch to both languages uh, however you want. Uh, the webinar is also going to be recorded in both languages, we hope. And I will be sharing the presentation that you see. Uh, so I will please ask all uh, speakers to let me know when I should switch the slides. Um, as you can see in the agenda, uh, the country offices will have quite a short time to speak, but we need to keep time of, uh, track of the time. So I will let you know when you're close to two minutes and 30 seconds. And uh, we also will have a question, questions and answers session in the end. Uh, so please keep your questions till the end and you can ask them in the chat. We'll be trying to answer them right there or we we'll, can discuss in the end of the webinar. That's it from me uh, at this time and we can proceed to Eswatini. You will have to unmute yourself. Um, good afternoon uh, colleagues, good morning for those that it is morning with. Um, my name is Kukuletu Lamini. Um, Petra, maybe you can advise me, do you want me to switch my video on or I'm okay speaking uh, without? Yes, you're comfortable. It's fine. Okay. Maybe let me switch it on. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, um, colleagues, and thank you for this opportunity, Renata, Usman, uh, Petra, thank you for the opportunity that you've given us what you need to actually uh, talk about um, the, the, the social protection context in, in the country. And I'll be very, very brief in my presentation. I just have that one slide just to highlight a few issues. I think first and foremost, we would just like to say that um, as a country, there is a lot that has been happening around the social protection agenda. However, it has been ad hoc. At the moment, we are talking mainly social assistance, which is basically targeted at the vulnerable including old aged, including OVCs, and including the disabled. Uh, however, that social assistance is obviously not covering all the vulnerable uh, population in the country. There is also a draft, uh, currently a draft social assistance policy, which actually UNDP has been requested by the ministry responsible for it to actually support them to finalize it and then validate it so that it, it can actually by, be finalized. But firstly, it obviously has to be reviewed because uh, COVID has obviously um, brought in a lot of impacts which need to be reviewed in terms of the definition of vulnerability and who social assistance should actually be targeted to. And then there also is a social security policy which rests with the Ministry of Labor and Social, um, well, and social uh, Security, which basically targets formal employment, which is also in draft. And I think when it comes to the challenges, that is one of the biggest issues with our current uh, policy framework, where most of the policies are actually in draft and they are actually not even speaking to each other uh, per se. So that also um, is, is the current situation. 
The EU did uh, provide some support um, in, in the previous years on social protection, where they were actually trying to build a social protection system. However, that project did not actually, um, was not actually completed and as such the country still remains with no um, registry or social protection system that we can actually say is actually functional and that leads to it the, the support currently on social protection being very ad hoc um, and at the moment with the COVID obviously it has highlighted the impact on the informal e economy or the informal sector there is currently no targeted support to the informal sector to the point that even the the government um, assistance program which is looking at uh, social security for the employed is actually just supporting and targeting those that are currently in formal employment so unemployed informal um, sector is not receiving any form of assistance. UNDP, um, together with WFP, actually uh, did a, a project as part of the COVID response to provide social safety nets. And our target was really on the urban population in, in terms of the uh, informal sector. However, even that is just a drop in the ocean in terms of any support that is targeted towards the informal sector and any social protection. And what is an, it has unearthed is the fact that there is a lot of need to actually focus on social protection systems that actually um, promote livelihoods um, and, and target, um, you know, or, or redefine vulnerability. In terms of opportunities for UNDP and the RRF, obviously there's still a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of how we build on current initiatives and current uh, systems that are in place. And we are looking obviously at mapping and assessing the informal sector because at the moment we find that we are talking about the informal sector, but who exactly they are and where they are. You know, in, in most cases, we find that we do not have that proper definition, but also informal sector has normally been just labeled in as, in as far as ent enterprises are concerned, but the issue of formal em informal employment may not necessarily be there. So we're looking at mapping and assessing who the informal sector is. We are also thinking that, you know, we need to look at a, a, a social protection nexus, which targets livelihoods, vulnerability, and obviously the green economy, which is also providing opportunities for enhancing livelihoods and particularly uh, integrating the informal sector within, uh, within that aspect. And then there's obviously also social protection instruments. The current uh, program that we have been doing with uh, WFP has been advancing cash grants through a di digital platforms that WFP actually um, runs. And I think that has actually been what we are looking at uh, probably um, uh, scaling up um, uh, moving forward. Maybe my final uh, comment would be uh, as part of the questions, and I think these are some of the discussions that we would obviously want to hear about in terms of the RRF and whatever um, areas that we are looking into. Are we actually looking at focusing on high level upstream development, which is at the policy level, or we are actually just looking at downstream, which is the more, you know, um, where the, the social protection instruments can actually be um, be um, tried out or tested or, or, or whatever. So essentially, that is where we are as a country. We are excited about the opportunities that social protection provides for us. We are already in discussions with a number of our partners, including ILO, in terms of how we can actually partner uh, together with them, as well as UNICEF, in terms of uh, providing a, a better um, targeted social protection program in Eswatini. I will leave it there for now. Thank you very much, Petra. Thank you, colleagues, for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gugu. That was very interesting. Uh, we can also discuss in the end of the webinar uh, if there are any questions related to this item. Uh, now I would like to invite Eritrea. You will have to unmute yourself. Hello. Hi, I hope you can hear me. Uh, this is uh, Eritrea. We hear you. Hello. And, uh, okay, yeah, thanks, thanks. So let, let me uh, maybe begin by just providing uh, uh, the context. And here I want to uh, mention that um, Eritrea, in terms of the social uh, protection ecosystem, uh, has in place uh, a, legisl a legislative framework uh, on, on social protection. And I think this emanates uh, from the history 
uh, of the country. As you know, it's among the last countries to have gained uh, independence in Africa, and therefore they had been engaged uh, in a protracted uh, war of liberation. Uh, and therefore the extent of vulnerability uh, was quite uh, large in the context of Eritrea, but the government uh, did make a point uh, of putting in place uh, uh, safety nets and other social protection mechanism uh, to protect particularly uh, people with disability, uh, mainly emanating uh, from a history of war, but, but also targeting uh, uh, children and, and, and the elderly. And so in terms of the policies, I, I should say that um, the country does have a strategy, uh, social protection policies and strategies uh, in place. But I think um, mirroring uh, what a colleague from uh, Eswatini presented, I think the whole issue now is how do you put in place a, a comprehensive um, policy framework or social protection system? And I think that's where UNDP intervention becomes critical in terms of bringing together all the different uh, pieces of legislation and policies to address uh, social protection in a holistic manner. In terms of the focus, I, I think the focus has been mainly on reducing economic and social vulnerability, mainly through social assistance uh, based on equity and, and social justice. Uh, and issues around social justice and equity uh, resonate uh, within the country national philosophy. And so in a sense, um, our focus has been mainly looking at informal uh, safety nets. Uh, and these informal safety net mechanisms, uh, you'll all agree, have not been able to cope with the impact of the COVID-19 because COVID-19 has had a tremendous impact. Uh, and therefore, calling for a rethink in terms of how do you have a more formal mechanism uh, of social safety nets that can safeguard, uh, safeguard uh, the vulnerable uh, people. And therefore, in the context of the COVID, uh, our, our focus has been at the moment mainly on the emergency relief support uh, in terms of the cash uh, and food transfers. But now we want to move uh, deeper into looking at the whole issue of the formality. And therefore, the RFR, our um, RFF, we, we mainly look at the issue of the informality and how we can help businesses that have been impacted. Uh, by COVID-19. Uh, uh, and so in the case of Eritrea, and based on the labor force survey that was done in 2015, informal economy accounts for 31.5%. Uh, and therefore, this is quite large if, if you exclude the agriculture. Uh, and in the case of Eritrea, informality is basically uh, an urban phenomenon. And, and in terms of the dependency on, on the informality, I, I think it's quite huge, particularly for livelihoods. And this is typical, particularly uh, in most of the urban centers. Uh, with COVID-19 uh, uh, and the decline in remittances and COVID restrictions, we've seen a huge impact in terms of uh, livelihoods that depend on, on the informality. Uh, and the lockdown in, in Eritrea has been quite huge. And so the issue for us has been meant to see how we can intervene with both our immediate but also long-term uh, perspective on how uh, we can deepen our social protection mechanism. And hence, the of our RFF is mainly two-pronged. One, immediate emergency relief for informal workers affected by the pandemic. Uh, and then the second approach, which I think is where we need to put a lot of focus on, is building a pathway for long-term national uh, social protection system uh, that is anchored in the principle of leaving no one behind. And here is basically, we have to do the mapping and, and the targeting in, in terms of the small businesses and, and look at the numbers on how people are affected, but also taking into account the, 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 the a number of people, uh, actually um, uh, a number of those in the sector are women. And therefore, the UNDP program will aim to improve on the social economic inclusion uh, of the vulnerable populations uh, by, a, by a combination of both looking at the income as support uh, in terms of the cash transfers, but also Sorry, James, uh, could you please wrap up? Uh, yeah, but also addressing uh, service delivery to enhance uh, the livelihood. Uh, in terms of partnership, just wrap up, we look at how we can plan and deliver this program with, us, with, with the important partnership of the ILO. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, James, for coming in.
the next item we have uh, would be Renata, actually. Can you unmute yourself? Yes, thanks. And um, let me start the video so you can see me. Um, good afternoon, good morning, colleagues, and great to see many friends and colleagues um, see and, and see on the participants list. Unfortunately, James, your presentation was not very clear. I think the connection was, uh, was uh, quite bad. Um, but but we, we get we got the gist of it and uh, Google thank you for setting the scene with Iswatini's um, very complex uh, sort of landscape of social protection in also in terms of what would need to be done. Um, so before before uh, we go to the nitty gritty of RFF process on social protection. Uh, I would like to kind of um, give you some um, some framework maybe um, of what to look at if you think about an integrated social protection approach which which we are promoting and would like you to consider when you do the RFFs on social protection. Everybody knows that social protection is about reducing poverty, vulnerability. It has also been um, found to um, sometimes reduce inequality and uh, in, can in help increase human capital and you know protects from risks along the life cycle and so on and this is this framework protect prevent promote and transform protect meaning from the crisis prevent help people build assets and capacities that would not uh, make them fall into poverty when the next crisis hits a primary example right now Promote, it's about economic empowerment and empowerment in other ways so that people can join social economic uh, mainstream and transform to make sure that the integration is, is complete. But also, and this is a little bit uh, more tricky, and I think um, why we promote this integrated approach is that UNDP has a, a, a very big portfolio of diverse disciplines and programs. And if we design social protection interventions in a way, uh, in a specific way, purposely, then we can also uh, help with the other objective, with the complementary or secondary objectives of social protection. So for example, you have a gender equality, green economy, which Usman will talk about governance, social inclusion. Um, if you have programming that really targets um, persons with disability, not just in terms of cash transfers, but in terms of agency and voice and participation, then you really hope, uh, help with, with their inclusion. If you promote uh, cash transfers with in, in cultures where girls are not sent to school, you will promote the gender equality in this way. So th this is the integrated approach that we, we have in mind and would like to, um, for you to, to consider. Um, next slide, please. So what we did in, in the guidance note, uh, we looked at, uh, uh, oh, sorry. Okay, <laughs> I, I got a bit confused. Um, having said that social protection um, can contribute to so many different development outcomes, we can, um, we can hear critics say that, you know, it's diluted and it's about everything. It's not. You need to look at instruments which kind of set boundaries what social protection is when what social protection is not. And this is the slide shows the taxonomy of different instruments that you can consider. If it's not part of those instruments, it's not really social protection programming. So we, uh, we know that social insurance uh, on the right side, contributory is not really um, sort of something that uh, we need to concern ourselves uh, with because uh, African economies are very highly informal. But if you look at social assistance, we have different cash transfers, public works, fee waivers, different subsidies and so on, social care services. And then on the right side, we have labor market policies and intervention. This is very important uh, since we hear that informal sector, informal economy workers are extremely important for uh, our focus as UNDP and different skills building, training, retraining, other interventions that allow uh, people also to have access to, um, to um, finance and financial inclusion would go under uh, labor market policies and interventions and 
um, social services. So these would be something to consider when you design this project level uh, interventions, what kind of uh, instruments you would like to use. Um, next slide, please. So how we uh, went about this guidance notes, um, we looked at the template and we saw the core elements that you asked to, uh, you asked to uh, respond to. It's a very short, uh, short proposal, but nevertheless, the thinking behind it, I'm sure it's not. So um, there are key elements and steps that you, you should think about. First, data um, and for the situation analysis. If the country has, uh, if the country has the has done the social economic impact assessment, that's the first point of reference. Otherwise, uh, because it will discuss what vulnerable groups have been uh, have been uh, especially hit by COVID um, sectors of the economy and the overall uh, situation and impacts of the of the pandemic. Otherwise, you can do um, secondary literature review. Um, what is also important, especially for social protection, as you, as you I'm sure know, is to consider political economy of social protection. Uh, it's a very politicized uh, tool and can be used for and against um, different interests and power structures in the country. Um, as as uh, Iswatini and Eritrea mentioned, we also interested in policies and making a pathway towards, uh, towards something that has can be catalytic and be a systemic change then we need to know whether the government is, is and the whole society actually buys into this idea or not and what are the power structures behind that so this is something to consider uh, also i um, also partners in the country perhaps that's not going into the into your situation analysis but it's very important especially for UNDP because we're not traditionally seen as the key partner for social protection. It's important to see what is the landscape with big donors, what is UNICEF doing, World Bank, the ILO, how can we complement their efforts. And perhaps you need to additional assessments and the resources section has different assessments that you can look at, specific assessment if you want to design public works, if you want to do, uh, if you want to do system review and so on you have some tools that you can can be used and this should be incorporated in part as part of your um, uh, as part of your uh, project proposal then we go to the what what is the social protection for in in um, what kind of primary objective the poverty and vulnerability i assume that's that's always the case and then whether you have a secondary objective which google mentioned for example the green economy or uh, James mentioned the development of the uh, enterprises and also sort of policy policy level. The next step, the what and the who. Uh, so who is the social protection for? And that's a key question uh, because we cannot, and countries you know, usually do not have universal schemes and, and this funding is 18, 18, 18 months and it's quite con constrained. So we need to be very, strategic about who social protection would be uh, would be directed at i hear a lot and perhaps uh, this is for further discussion informal economy workers and that's also in line with um, our own study of of what undp could really enter uh, into in africa in terms of support on social protection so informal economy workers definitely a group that i see also from the first wave of our RFs, that that's something that, um, that you might look at. Uh, but obviously, uh, then there, there is a whole um, set of issues around uh, targeting and, and eligibility criteria and the design of this once you have the whom answered. And of course, this, this what and for whom uh, will determine um, the type of interventions and instruments that we, we have seen uh, in this previous slide. Um, the question from Iswatini is a very valid one. Shall we go upstream, downstream, or, or um, you know, upstream do a policy or downstream do, let's say, project that has six months of cash transfers to um, informal economy workers or small enterprises and then sort of uh, is a one-off one intervention. And I, it really depends on the country context, but we would definitely encourage uh, to think about uh, systemic change and systems approach. So some sort of policy, uh, some sort of policy um, element 
would be really good to include uh, and support to that uh, to that policy in the in the in the R app. And perhaps in Iswatini, there's a very, you, you mentioned you have many different policies, they're all drafts, so you need to think about advocacy around them, about the review of the policies and all those things that could really um, consolidate what the country already has. So, uh, and then again, uh, the choice of instruments will, will, will follow and type of support. Um, I just mentioned that system approach uh, is something that we very much encourage because that uh, that that is the catalytic uh, sort of uh, requirement of the RF that projects should be catalytic. They should lead to something and not finish after 18 months. And this is why sequencing is also important um, and thinking about, which I think uh, James nailed it in his presentation because he said that we will have the you know immediate which absolutely is needed the immediate relief and then longer term this which is a pathway to creating a social protection more more sustainable social protection system and i will leave you with um the last uh, the last slide uh, which is on on um, some key features of a social protection a social protection um, scheme or a program. So you 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 also have to think what is what will be needed and how to uh, program around it. For example, so if you have cash for work or cash transfers, you need to deal with the identification. There is a lot of issues around that. The, then you need to um, determine um, eligibility of the of the. Can can we have the slide back? It shows Iswatini on my screen. Um, so you need to determine the eligibility of um, the eligibility of, of of the participants. Then you need to enroll them. Then you make make payments, and you have some. You need to have some sort of exits and graduation strategy. And all of this involves um, it can involve digital solutions. Uh, you need to think about you know amount of transfers. You need to think about um, uh, actual financial inclusion, uh, whether it's possible to use digital solutions, which obviously UNDP encourages very much, and there are some resources also listed in the guidance notes around that. Um, so I, I will stop here and um, thank you. As, as, uh, as Usman said, we, we, we are happy to discuss any of this with you in more detail. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Renata. Um, I would like to invite Comoros country office now. Uh, you will have to unmute yourself and I will share your slides. Do we have someone from Comoros here? You're probably muted. Hi, Petra, there's a message that Titus is going to speak uh, in the chat box. Yes, but I don't see him as participant, so he might not be here yet. Does anyone know, do you want to come in instead? Or Usman, do you want to continue and then we come back to Comoros? Sure, I can go ahead now. Okay, I'll share your slide now. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
So it's me, Usman Iftikhar again. And I'm here to sort of talk about three principles, which I think is going to be, uh, we sort of encourage you to take on board. And they're centered around the idea of innovation, sequencing, and transformation. Oh, uh, Petra, you have Titus there now, uh, if you want to go back. I, I, Johnny, I know that. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. I will share your slide if you want to come in now. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm glad that you can hear me. Um, this is uh, Comoros. Um, um, are we? First of all, I want to start with the context. Like you know, uh, Pomoro is a sea state, that is a small island state. Um, but then we are the, the country is highly dependent on external resources and highly vulnerable to um, catastrophe and disasters, like you remember. Um, last year we were also affected by Hurricane Kenneth, and this year we have the issue of um, the, uh, the impact of the COVID, uh, which is uh, for the, I think it's good to take note of the impact, the special impact that the COVID also has on the small island states, the, the, the state because of their nature. And also oftentimes it's kind of the landlock, uh, even though surrounded by ocean, uh, access is usually very restricted. Uh, poverty is high, social cohesion is relatively weak. Um, also, and the country is marked by oftentimes discontinuity and risk of uh, separation. COVID-19, like you know, is a sanitary crisis, you know, that seem, uh, seems to be contained, um, but the recovery, you know, the impact, the socioeconomic impact is high and it's going to last with us for, for some time. Uh, so based on that, we, we need to strengthen the country's resilience across all sectors. And that's why we look at the, um, the principle or the, the three main principles that we put in our proposal, you know, is integration, where we co create connections among pillars to maximize the impact, especially on the most vulnerable. Also, we talk about inclusiveness, we take that into consideration to design the approach that includes the youth, the women, and people living with disabilities not only as beneficiaries, but also as decision makers. Um, then the third principle is the complementarity. Um, our proposal is based on UNDP offer, which derives from the UN offer, um, as we work uh, in an integrated manner with other UN agencies, and that completes uh, the overall. Our approach, uh, like we see from the, the slide, is uh, Forward looking, that's the part of uh, the first thing that we do. You know, um, we consider the crisis that requires due reflection on how to cope with the new economy because everything has changed. The social and human constraints, but also uh, how to take advantage of this particular context to push the 2030 agenda uh, to move it forward. And then uh, we also look at the, uh, the approach of catalytic, which is the uh, we build on initiatives that have been launched. Uh, or will be, you know, um, refined, you know, committantly at the same time to maximize the impact that we uh, they're going to have. For instance, we have uh, several bridges, you know, with the, with the built between the MPTF funding, the track two and the vertical funds, um, but also with other partners that are in the same uh, development exercise with us, uh, activities with us. And um, of course, everything is based on government priorities. Then we also take advantage of the digital by default, you know, and um, how the crisis becomes an opportunity for us. Uh, we want to take advantage of that as an op opportunity to accelerate the transition to digital using digital tools, you know, as a motor for the. For, Sorry, for Titus, the could you please wrap up? We can still finish uh, in the end of the webinar. So the, the, uh, on the issue of opportunity that. Um, you can see that we, we take advantage or we, we propose to take the advantage of the, uh, of the crisis to build back better um, 
based on the transition and transformation of the country, supporting using the data um, approach and integration with the various social governance, green economy, and social protection together. And the issues that we have, you know, um, I've mentioned it at the beginning, it's just about the size and um, the fact that we have uh, um, support from outside. Uh, this is the approach that we use, the integration, the complementarity and inclusiveness, and um, the challenge that we have to be able to have a catalytic approach for the funding. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Titus. Um, Usman, would you like to continue? Yeah, I think uh, I would continue if you could spring up the slide. And um, I'm grateful for the country presentations. They've really enriched the discussion here and kind of made my job a little easier. Um, and I, I, I have like just three basic points uh, for um, uh, as guidance, I guess. And I think the three uh, areas are to innovate. And the idea is how do you innovate by leveraging social protection mechanisms? And uh, basically what uh, we are now beginning to talk about is we need to go beyond just the uh, uh, general conception of social protection from just protection, right? Uh, to make sure that people don't fall further into poverty and, and, and are stabilized, but to move towards more of promotion. And the original idea of these kind of innovations came from uh, a, two renowned programs. Basically, one is Vos La Familia, where the idea was using to use a conditional cash transfer to not only address the issue of poverty at household level, but also the condition was if you send your children to school and they uh, take a health test every month or so, uh, you will get this condition no trash uh, to, for you. In a sense, what this was addressing was not only the poverty inequality, but also health and education. Um, over time, what's been happening is that the idea of conditional cash transfer has transformed into more of this public green works idea. And this was where the uh, National Rural Employment Guarantee Program of India looked to provide uh, seasonal workers with additional cash to smooth their uh, income over lean periods, uh, but by working to rehabilitate the environment. So again, there is looking at how do you use a social protection mechanism and then begin to move towards a green economy idea through rehabilitating community assets, for example. Now, the problem over there is that you, that's, these are short term in nature, so you need to have some broader ideas. So there's been more innovation in using some things like educational vouchers or fee waivers that Renata mentioned, and these can then be targeted towards F MSMEs and job uh, training sort of a thing. And you can also look at it from targeting youth and women as well. Over time, more recent uh, uh, innovations, and these have come from like community-based development uh, initiatives where they do something called collective social protection or community-based social protection, where they collect savings and individual households use it to leverage access to finance. And from this point of view, you can access inputs that would be for sustainable agriculture or sustainable forestry or sustainable uh, fishing, for example. And then you're creating sectors of green economy that can become more inclusive and boom over time. Now, in terms of technologies, you can think about that as more about improving and expanding the coverage where infrastructure is a constraint, particularly and improve the delivery and accountability of uh, how these things are, can be targeted and bought right to the households uh, through a mobile phone, for example. And over time, as e e is what Dini is thinking about, how do you use these digital technologies to actually register and sort of grow a system of social protection over a longer period of time? Then from a governance point of view, think about facilitating inclusion um, Renata's presentation uh, basically mentioned that it's not just the output that matters, it's the process that matters as well too. So how can it be 
uh, done and uh, apply more participatory approaches that empower local communities to provide input into the design of the very mechanism uh, in a way that will most benefit them. The second bit is the sequencing and uh, a number of countries are talking about it, Eritrea particularly, and I believe Comoros also was alluding to this, that we need to move beyond just the need to protect. And we need to think about this sequentially and systematically. And think about it from a graduating point of view. So you did a public works for green economy sort of thing. But now how do you move towards promotion and transformation, right? And, and, and these, these are uh, mechanisms that are available and we can definitely help you to sort of shape this. And from my point of view and our point of view, we're looking at transformation from uh, as uh, this idea of fundamentally addressing the underlying constraints. Uh, they can be at both the micro level and the macro level that perpetuate vulnerability, right? So the short-term emergency sort of cash it's not going to look at any underlying problems, right? Because people, what they're doing uh, in the sense of uh, being stuck in informality and subsistence is that they're lacking access to education or training or technologies or credit. And so how can we then put in mechanisms that move towards a more systematic approach that actually enhance the real incomes and capabilities and build their assets so they're more resilient uh, and, 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 you know, and, and sustainable and equitable and, and they grow over time. So these are three principles that I think would be quite useful and we're very happy to provide you support in designing your RRF, RFFs. Sorry. <laughs> Back to you, Petra. Thank you, Usman. Uh, you were on time. Great. Uh, I would like to invite now um, the country office from Namibia. You will have to unmute yourself. Do we have anyone from I Namibia here? Ah, okay, I hear you. So I thought not only unmute myself, but also show myself. So that, okay, good afternoon, good morning, uh, colleagues, or good evening, um, wherever you are. And I, I really thank you for this opportunity to share what we are doing in uh, Namibia. Uh, we are coming in um, uh, basically not uh, so much in terms of saying what we are doing um, uh, for the RRF, but this is a process that we embarked upon um, uh, I think about a, a, over a year ago, actually. Um, so that's what we are uh, sharing with you uh, today. Um, and thank you very much. I think uh, it's been good listening to Iswatini as well as Comoros and uh, uh, Eritrea uh, earlier on. And uh, we do see some uh, real uh, common threads as the, uh, in, that, in the work that we are doing. I'm going to be speaking about the feasibility analysis that Namibia has carried out um, on uh, instituting a basic income grant. Namibia is one of the few African countries, I would say, which, uh, which has consistently, in, um, uh, since after independence, um, allocated uh, about 30% of its um, uh, budget uh, uh, as um, uh, to the uh, social protection um, uh, sector, and uh, it has been um, uh, sorry, thirty percent of its GDP. Sorry, not its budget. Thirty percent of its uh, GDP towards social protection. Uh, recently, now the government is uh, deliberating upon a social protection uh, policy. Uh, framework which has been put together by UNICEF uh, with support uh, from the EU and uh, it was with cabinet till recently but I think uh, there is some still some more work to be done and the feasibility uh, analysis that uh, we are doing as UNDP on the basic income grant um, comes um, from an earlier pilot uh, that was conducted in 2008 
uh, where about 1,000 people in a small community really benefited from this basic income grant. Um, it supported them uh, um, uh, through a number of things and it reduced uh, to a great extent the poverty levels in that community. It empowered them to carry on uh, with other activities as well. So this uh, process uh, has been inspired by that and the Ministry of Poverty actually reached out to UNDP to sort of uh, uh, conduct, uh, co uh, help them uh, conduct this uh, analysis. And with this analysis has been done, and uh, we have been uh, discussing, having stakeholder discussions on it to determine the viability of either having a universal basic income grant for the age group of 15 to uh, 19 to 59. And that is the age cohort which actually is not benefiting from any of the existing social. Uh, uh, grants or uh, social assistance uh, programs. Uh, government had started with the initiative on food banks because this country was perpetually facing uh, drought and food insecurity and food banks were started. Those are being phased out and this is the uh, um, uh, uh, social protection measure which would now be uh, brought in. Uh, we have uh, also been receiving very valuable feedback uh, from headquarters, particularly Renetta um, and uh, George. Uh, Renetta is on the call and we are engaging uh, with the headquarters team as well. And we are taking it a step further uh, in terms of even conducting certain micro simulations in terms of the income levels, et cetera, and into what would be feasible. This feasibility study, which has been conducted in Namibia, uh, is uh, comparing the two. One is a universal basic income grant, and the other one is a conditional one, um, with obviously uh, varying uh, outputs uh, in that, and we are still considering that. Uh, but in the long run, if a universal basic income grant were to be given, um, uh, then the uh, conditional option is not favored, even though it is more cost effective, I mean, when you're taking a, a period of 10 years. Um, but here, I, I would just like to here pause and um, also indicate that while we were doing this, um, it, it's when I, this also goes back to the presentation made by Renata, how important data is, how important the foundational registry in countries is to be basically determining. Now we have a confusion whether if we take the severely poor people, which is about 17% of the population, or the cohort within the 17% population, which falls in the 15 to 59 group. So there is a little bit of a uh, confusion in terms of our statistics there and how we we are also supporting actually uh, the government uh, the ministry of home affairs in uh, strengthening the foundational registry system which is so very uh, critical um, uh, moving forward so we, we uh, were just wanted to share this particular experience uh, in terms of uh, uh, starting off with the basic income grant, and this follows very closely with what UNDP has come out with in the temporary basic income grant. And particularly in times of these pandemics, uh, the government had to actually scramble and uh, sort of um, in terms of giving out the emergency income grant. So uh, we have received a lot of positive feedback from stakeholders uh, in terms of instituting of a basic income grant. Uh, I do take also the points made by the previous presenter in terms of building up the assets and it's not being a handout, but that is fine. That should happen. But there is also some merit in having your basics uh, uh, catered for through this basic uh, income grant, uh, which proves to be very, very useful. And we have this, as I said, the pilot uh, study uh, to showcase um, uh, those uh, that uh, um, idea uh, as well. So let me just stop here. I didn't. I, I don't know because your time limit was there. I don't know how, whether I. I have. Yeah, you're uh, out of time, but it's okay. <laughs> okay. No, thank you so much. But basically, I've I've just uh, made the main points I had uh, uh, wanted to make. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Great. Thank you very much, Alka, for the short presentation. Uh, I would like to invite now Botswana, if you're here. I will share your PDF in a second. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you.
Um, maybe mine is going to be quite short. Um, and it is to say that when COVID uh, started and, and the whole lockdown happened, as the UNDP, we, uh, we took the lead in developing, uh, helping the government first to revise their current social protection system. And uh, we did this together with the UN family. So it included UNICEF, uh, the World Bank, ILO, and UNFPA. So we came together and uh, we as UNDP already have a big program with the Ministry of Local Government who's rolling this out and uh, we were therefore able to take the lead. I'm just going to focus on two or three points. First point is, if you see the top of the slide, it's a life course stage approach we took. So the current system that they had in the country dated back to the 1960s, which involved poverty, education, and many, many things. And you can see all the current programs in the forms of the different color balloons. So what was agreed is we take a life course approach. We start when the baby is born or prior to the baby is born, when they go to school, youth, working age, and old age. Now, by taking that framework, it meant that the current programs underneath it would have to be consolidated and also removed because uh, Renata bought out and Ultman bought out as well. So the idea on the student, there was a program around the uh, students. Now that that's been converted into a student loans and it's to be taken out because it doesn't necessarily belong here. And EP Link, it's another one helping at the local level in terms of creating jobs. Uh, that's going to be taken out and really focus the social protection as social protection. So two messages in this one. We're adopting a life course. So it's not about you graduate into one or out of one. It is about every stage in your life, you will need help. And let's adopt that we'll need help and not about, okay, if we graduate, we don't have to help anymore. So that was one. Second message is there were many, many programs going back to the 90s, uh, as I say, 60s and 70s that originated in poverty, originate out of disaster, originate out of HIV. They're now being re-energized, consolidated, and brought into defining what a social protection system would look like. So now I'll run straight down to the, la the end of the slide, uh, please, uh, Petra. And the message I want to share here is that given that all the UN family are helping, we were able to define, because of the life course, which UN agency, you see key development partners, which UN agency would most likely help at what stage in that life course? And you see UNICEF, UNICEF at the beginning, UNICEF, FAO for the feeding program, UNFPA and the World Bank, ILO and UNFPA. And generally, UNDP comes in in the horizontal. So that's, we come in and helping with the systems side of it, a single registry around measuring deliver, delivery, any grievance systems, communication, MIS and ME. So we are now looking at for the RRF or going forward how to help them in this domain around the systems part, while the other individual parts can be helped by the other UN agencies so that we get this together. Now, at the same time as we help the government develop this social protection COVID recovery plan, we also help the government develop a private sector recovery plan. And we, the consultants and so on, linked up the relationship between the private sector and this one. At the same time, we help the government develop an informal sector recovery plan. And again, we linked up the linkages between the social protection and what social protection aspects were encouraged in the informal sector. So we've got three recovery plans now. This one very much for social protection and we are looking at what element of the systems can we support going forward that could become part of the RRF. And arising out of this, uh, for two years there was a social protection framework that was moving around in the ministry, but we got the minister really involved in the development of this new social protection system and this particular diagram, which got incorporated into the ongoing framework and actually was approved by Parliament last week. So this is about planning the system, about it's a plan. Now it's about the implementing. And as I say, we will help in developing some of these systems as part of implementing. They're really the messages, over. Thank you very much, Jacinta. Uh, now we can move on to the questions and answers. 
Uh, Renata, do you want to come in? Yes, great. Thank you, Petra. And thank you so much to, to all the colleagues from, from countries to give us a flavor of, of where you are with, with your social protection programming. And I actually really am glad that we could finish on such a strong note with Botswana that has done so much in such a short time that it's a very impressive um, piece of work from our perspective because not only you have mapped uh, you know, our, our relative strength within the complex UN support system, but you also have managed to really address the bottlenecks of the current, or, or, or rather uh, sort of review and consolidate the current uh, social protection system in, in Botswana. And you connect it to the informal and private sector aspects. So this is, this is very, um, it's, it's really great to see, and um, and we look forward to to seeing what you will, um, what we will have in there. Are that, and and just just the kind of uh, general comments on on the different needs and different stages. So we have quite advanced in Southern Africa, as you know, the social protection is is more mature than in Eastern Africa, and we have, um, you know, we have Eritrea that is really in a, in a very difficult uh, and very different context than, let's say, uh, Iswatini or Namibia. With Namibia, that's also um, it, it. Really shows how diverse UNDP portfolio could become on on this topic in Namibia. And and maybe if you haven't seen, there is this very good paper by uh, UNDP headquarters George on the temporary uh, universal income in response to COVID. And Namibia is now considering uh, considering this as part of the the support to the government. So um, yeah, let let us hear from if you have uh, specific questions or would like to contribute to the discussion. In the chat, I only seen a comment about you know um, uh, upstream policy versus projects approach, uh, and it seems to it seems to favor both depending on the context. But let's let's hear more from from everyone. Thank you. You can just unmute yourself and talk if that's okay. It's always uh, difficult to start, so maybe we have one volunteer. Um, maybe Daisy, I see that you have um, put something on chat. Perhaps you can come in. Sorry to put you on the spot like that. Yeah, maybe I can just read. I, I really like the Botswana partnership arrangement. The roles are very clear. And I like the cross-cutting roles that UNDP plays. But I was thinking maybe we can add the governance side of, of things. Not UNDP just supporting social protection policies, laws, regulations, and institutions. But we also know, for example, that corruption is one of the major issues when we are talking about, let's say, social grants. So I think UNDP is best positioned uh, to deal with those governance issues. Thank you. Do we have any other answers or comments, questions or comments? Um, I, I have a question. Uh, Great, this please is go on. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for organizing this, and I think we have um, we have all um, uh, got a lot of um, additional inputs into into the various questions and the various aspects, uh, integration and uh, the rest uh, of the of the principles. Um, in the process of the RRF funding. Um, 
is there any way um, country offices can still make uh, additional requests before the final approval? Or is done, it's just to finalize now. And if yes, what can we do and what do you advise the country offices to do? Sir, if, if, if I understand correctly, is your question whether um, there is additional stage when you submit your proposal or if that's the final yeah let me uh, i know they have um there's been some uh, proposed um allocation based on the initial uh, request or proposal submitted um but we still have to submit yeah we've not finalized uh, can country offices uh put additional requests in when they are submitting the <laughs> final request or proposal, or is done. Uh, yeah. Oh, that that we need to probably get back to you with uh, with um, about the RFF conditions. Um, what what the guidelines saying basically that you know that template that you have that's it. That's the one thing you sent, and based on that there will be. Um, allocations will be made, but whether there is an opportunity for another submission, we would need to um, get back to you. I don't think so, but we can we can definitely check. Or perhaps if someone is from uh, from RBA side on the on the call, perhaps you can come in and answer that. I also see Alessandra has her hand up, so if you want to, you can come in now. Thank you, Petra. Thanks. Renata and all colleagues. Uh, so this is Alessandra from the Resilience Hub in Nairobi. Um, I have a, a question to more to our country office colleagues. Um, so I, I, I was delighted to, uh, to listen to the country offices uh, presentation because for me this is a clear sign that UNDP is really breaking into the sector. And I do remember that uh, we, we started working in, on social protection with Renata, um, when was it, six years ago? Um, and there was a lot of shyness, uh, particularly at the country level, to enter this sector. So UNDP was a little bit confused and didn't really know what exactly uh, we had to offer, how to engage on social protection. And so it's, it's actually great to see that country offices now are really um, engaging uh, with governments on, social, on the social protection agenda. My question is, uh, uh, what was the, 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 the tipping point? You know, what, what was, um, the, 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 how did you, did you engage in this sector? What was the factor that really pushed it? Definitely COVID um, is one of these factors we see because of course with COVID, it has become apparent that social protection is a critical uh, policy instrument to, to, to protect people, to, to uh, start lifting them out of poverty. Um, but uh, obviously, and I, and I was listening very carefully to, uh, to the presentation of ALCA, but also uh, uh, Botswana, it, you know, obviously we did enter this sector a lot before COVID. So it's more to hear how did we get into uh, the sector? What, what was the, the uh, how did we get the confidence to engage on social protection uh, at the country level? Thank you very much. Over to you. Petra, thanks. Thank you very much, Alessandra. If there's anyone wishing to answer that, you can just come in. Okay, this is um, Alka from Namibia. Uh, for Namibia, actually, we had uh, worked uh, as UNDP on um, uh, poverty blueprint for the government. There was a separate Ministry of Poverty, but which has now been merged with the gender uh, we had worked on the poverty and uh, wealth uh, 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 blueprint for the country. 
And after that, it was the minister who, who really actually reached out uh, uh, to us uh, to sort of uh, have a more formalized um, um, policy around the basic income grant, which, as I said, they had just done it as a small pilot. This was an organization of churches, which, has, which had done it for the communities. And from there, that's how we, we, we actually uh, got involved and the ministry had reached out to us and then we started engaging with the feasibility uh, analysis. Um, and uh, that, that was pretty much how the UNDP Namibia got involved uh, in this sector. But I, I, and I, I do take uh, note of all the presentations which have been made, particularly Renata and uh, also that by Usman. I, I mean, I, I really believe and I'm convinced that whole systems thinking approach, the systems approach, when you are uh, going for it, uh, it needs to be brought in into any of the uh, kind of interventions that UNDP may be engage, engaging in the recovery phase uh, um, or the recovery interventions of uh, COVID-19. So I just wanted to uh, sort of uh, share that with you. Thanks. Maybe from Botswana. Uh, it's true that here in Botswana, the UNICEF already had been involved from a child perspective, and they were working on that element of social protection. The World Bank had been working some years ago in terms of looking at single registry. So when the whole COVID started and UNDP was given the technical lead to, to run with a number of things, given that the social protection was such a big issue, within uh, the whole uh, social side. Um, and because we already have a very strong program with the Ministry of Local Government, and, and like I work closely with the Minister, then I suggested, well, this, maybe this is the time that we should now reflect on the whole social protection system. And he said he, he would agree that, let us look at the whole, uh, the whole system uh, and come up with a recovery plan for it. And with that then, I, that's when I engaged all the UN system, including the World Bank, and said, look, are you willing to come aboard uh, to look at the whole system, do a review of the system, all the aspects with it, and come up with a recovery plan of how to improve the system in itself and the rollout of that system. So uh, that's when we brought the consultants from IDS on board, and, and uh, we had two very good consultants. So if anybody is ever looking for good consultants, please come back to us and we'll share the CVs. They were excellent, very practical, to the point, uh, and were able to get immediately in on what the big issues were. So I think it was the COVID certainly helped us. Give, we were given the technical lead, and because we're given the technical lead, we could play a much bigger role. We were, as I say, because of that technical lead, it, it was easier for me then to bring the whole UN family on board and each felt they were playing their role. So now we have out of that a, a review of the system, the impact COVID was having on the system and now a plan of going forward. So we're, we're in a good space in terms of now moving forward and in terms of who then wants to take up uh, aspects. And I know the World Bank have moved back now and, and really pushing the single registry since all of this has happened. And uh, even we're having dialogue with the ministry in terms of what is the area that we could support as, as UNDP. So it has given new energy to the UN family also uh, to push forward, including with the ILO. Over. Thank you, Alka and Yacinta, for sharing. Uh, I see one more question in the chat. Um, Farah, if you want to come in, you can, but otherwise I can read your question if there is any answer from the audience. Uh, okay, please, so, do, do oh, please go on. No, just to read the question, uh, um, I was just asking about, uh, you know, remittances. I've just come out of a meeting, uh, a webinar meeting uh, this morning, uh, where we're discussing remittances and uh, the role that they can play in terms of social protection. So this is why I was asking this question. And the question is, uh, um, in consideration of uh, um, upstream intervention, what are country offices doing to leverage remittances for social protection?
Would anyone like to follow up on that? Perhaps not at this point. Are there any other questions or comments? Okay, um, seeing that we already have 2.15, or at least my time, so we're 15 minutes over. Uh, the hour. Um, let me thank you everyone for joining us today and especially to Gugu, James, Titus, Alkan, Yacinta for sharing their country experience. Uh, we will share the presentation slides after the webinar and we remain available to any questions that you might have uh, even after the webinar or any time that you need. Uh, you can still reach us and Thank you for interpretation, Mari. Thank you for translating. And thank you everyone for joining. And that will be all from us today.